Hello and welcome. Thank you for coming to this Explore History program. My name is Carrie Edinger. I'm the Historic Program Manager for the Sheridan Community Land Trust. And this is a partnership with the Hub on Smith. We do Explore History every second Tuesday of the month at 10.30 a.m., ranging from various local history topics. Um, I would like to thank the Hub for this partnership, also the YO Theater for the use of their facilities, and um, a little bit of housekeeping. The sign-in sheets that will be passed around is just to help us keep attendance and also future funding to keep the program going. Um, today, the program is in three parts. I will be giving a short presentation of Sheridan Y.O. Rodeo history. Judy Slack will be talking about All American Indian Days, and we will be showing Gregory Nickerson's documentary, No Indians or Dogs Allowed, Sheridan, Wyoming, and the Miss Indian America pageant. Sure, I'll say next slide, thank you. <laughs> um, so to begin this program, I will be presenting on some of the highlights of the Sheridan Wyo Rodeo history. Um, the rodeo is celebrating its 91st anniversary this year, and it was not an easy task to condense this expansive history into this short presentation. Um, so I'll be going to World War II as kind of my cutoff point for this presentation. And I would like to give special thank you to Tom Ringley for his contribution and use of photos and other materials to put this presentation together. The majority of this information for my presentation came from Tom's book called Radio Time in Sheridan, Wyoming. And I recommend this book if you're interested in more rodeo history. Next slide, please. Okay. So in 1931, a rodeo was not a new idea to Sheridan, Wyoming. And here are a few early rodeo events before the Sheridan, Wyo Rodeo. This one was called Old Timers and Cowboys State Reunion and Revival of the Days of the Wild and Woolly West. It's quite a title, isn't it? Um, so it was described in the 1897 Sheridan Enterprise article as an event that was held for three days around the beginning of July, and it was at the fairgrounds, the first fairgrounds that used to be off of Coffee and Avenue, where the Mill Inn Motel is. And some of the highlights for this 1897 rodeo event was they had a procession from Sheridan Inn to the fairgrounds, kind of like a parade. They had commercial stalls selling food and drink and shooting galleries. The entertainment include contestants riding yearly steers and bucking horses, horse races, and even polo events. And it is also notated in that article that 500 Native American Indians were in attendance at this event. Next slide, please. So in 1914, the Sheridan Stampede was created. It was also a three-day event in conjunction with the 4th of July. And it was organized by local dentist, Dr. William Frackleton. And he was known around Sheridan as the sagebrush dentist. He was recruited by the Sheridan Commercial Club who were interested in having a Wild West contest. So some of the highlights from the 1914 event were a parade each day, 25 miles of auto races, a stagecoach hold up, roping and bronc busting, polo, and multiple Indian events. Um, and the Crow Indians were involved in those events. And according to the Sheridan Post article, the community had to receive government permission so the Crow Indians could come off the reservation for that 1914 event. Um, the Crow term botsots was used with advertising of this stampede event since it meant large, grand, or the best ever. And that's how they wanted to kind of describe the rodeo event. So this news clipping that you see here is the program schedule for the first day. And then the column article on the side is kind of like a travel update 
of the Crow tribe coming to Sheridan, and it also mentions that the Cheyenne tribe was also attending as well. Dr. William Frackleton did organize a 1915 event that took place on Labor Day this time, and he called the event a cowpuncher of a show. In 1916, Dr. William Frackleton was asked to organize another stampede show, but he claimed he had retired and suggested to the Sheridan Commercial Club to put together a big county fair. Next slide, please. Um, in 1928 and 29, large rodeos were held at the PK Ranch that is west of Sheridan on Soldier Creek. A 1928 Sheridan Post Enterprise article notated that nearly 20,000 people attended and 3,000 cars had 35 different state license plates on them. Next slide, please. So the first annual rodeo in Sheridan is the Sheridan Wyo Rodeo. The objective of the annual rodeo was to establish, maintain, and conduct pageants, rodeos, and similar shows, exhibits, and contests depicting the Old West, while also establishing and maintaining a structure that would support this annual event and have a permanent site, also funding. So these are just a few of the starting points for the establishment of the event and the organization. Um, the founders reached out to different rodeos, especially Cheyenne Frontier Days, to understand how to organize the event, also contracts that would be needed for the business end of the event. Um, they called their first meeting in January 28, 1931, and the meeting was held at the City Hall in the chamber, council chamber. And what the focus, one, one of the focuses was to get subscribers to the stock of Sheridan Wyo Rodeo Corporation and Association. Um, and then they also wanted to choose a name for the rodeo that was also on the agenda. This meeting was well attended and the secretary report show that 141 subscribers pledged $13,020 to start this annual event. Um, and then the third top thing was extensive improvements to the fairgrounds that are located off of Fifth Street. Because since they wanted this to be an annual national rodeo, they were expecting big audiences. So they needed more bleacher seating. Um, the Sheridan Wyo Rodeo Board also worked with the county commissioners for exclusive rights to the fairgrounds by arranging a 10-year lease. And next slide, please. Okay, so what's in a name? I wanted to mention how the name Sheridan Wyo Rodeo was chosen. Um, as I mentioned, it was one of the top things on the first meeting. There was a local contest that was held so citizens could participate in the selection of a name for this new event. So the three submissions, as we see here, are Sheridan Wyo Rodeo, Sheridan's Old West, and Sheridan's Frontier Jamboree. The committee in charge of the contest recommended Sheridan Wyo Rodeo as the first choice. The vote did not produce a majority, but as the minutes state, further discussion and suggestions followed, after which it was voted that the name was Sheridan Wyo Rodeo and it was adopted. Next slide, please. Okay. So this is the three, I'm gonna go kind of briefly cover over the three-day schedule for the first 1931 rodeo. It was held July 15th, 16th, and 17th, and at 10 a.m. was the parade. The Sheridan Press notated that it had everything from bands to Native Indian tribes, the American Legion drum and bugle corp, a prairie schooner, a 10-horse hitch driven by Walt Granger and Senator Speer and his son. And then in the afternoon was the actual rodeo. It is estimated that between five and 6,000 people watched the new Western show. The Sheridan Press described the rodeo as, quote, although the steers were fast and the calves were faster, some remarkable exhibits of riding, roping, and wrestling were offered by the top hands of rangeland as they battled for honors in the modern arena, which they openly declared as the best in the world. 
end quote. Um, in addition, there were also several racing events, relay race, the Indian relay race, and a wild horse race. Next slide, please. So the evening event was the Bighorn Indian Nights pageant. Chief Plenty Coops was from Crow Nation. He attended and participated in the Indian Nights evening event. Chief Plenty Coops was a warrior, diplomat, and mediator. In a vision in the crazy mountains, he saw the buffalo disappear and be replaced by cattle. A windstorm destroyed all the chief trees except the one in which the chickadee live, and himself as an old man sitting by a house. And we can kind of understand this with the idea of Western expansion happening at that time period. Um, it is stated that in the local newspaper that Chief Honey Coops did not speak English. So during this evening event, he told the Indian story of the creation of the world and also his great vision. Um, these stories were interpreted by Max Bigman, a noted Crow Scout and lecturer. Next slide, please. So for days two and three of the rodeo, they had different themes. So for the second day of the rodeo, it was declared Casper Billings Day. And the Wyoming Air Service Day Airlines had this idea of flying airplanes in the air by twos or threes for most of the afternoon while the rodeo was going on. And similar to the first day, there were events with riding roping races, and the Bighorn Indian Nights pageant was also in the evening. The attendance that is noted is that the second day of the rodeo had large attendance of dudes and dudines. Visitors from virtually every guest ranch in Wyoming and Montana enjoyed the fascinating and swift moving program. These dude ranch guests contributed to a colorful setting with their Western shirts and contrasting kerchiefs. And then the third day began with the Buffalo Wyoming band that led the parade and the contest in front of the grandstand. The Buffalo band performed because this day was declared Buffalo Day and it honored many visitors from the Buffalo and neighboring Johnson County who attended the rodeo that day. So the last day was focused on the finals of these events and it would be determined who would be crowned as the best all round cowboy at the first annual Sheridan Wyoming Rodeo, which was Dick Truitt of Stonewall, Oklahoma. So he won first place for steer roping and missed other championships by seconds. There is approximately $15,000 in purses won on this final day. And then again in the evening, we had the Bighorn Indian Nights pageant. Next slide, please. So the growth from 1931 to 41 had its challenges. Um, and it brought the success for the 19, um, from the 1931 rodeo. So they went on to plan for the next show. Uh, the beginning years of the rodeo were crucial to establish the board as well as the du duties and departments to continue this annual event. By 1933 though, the rodeo was almost canceled because of financial circumstances. The board decided on belt tightening measures and canceled the night show, which caused heated discussions. Um, another continued discussion was a new grandstand for the fairgrounds, and in 1936, the new grandstand project was completed. Next slide, please. So speaking of the fairgrounds, um, in 2011, this site was listed as the Sheridan County Fairgrounds Historical District. Um, it is listed on the National Registry of Historic Places. So this 40-acre site was eligible for this national listing for its association and importance with agriculture and rodeo events to Sheridan County. The first agriculture fair was held in 1885, and that was actually near the town of Bighorn. Um, and the buildings that also contribute to this being a historic site are a 1923 brick exhibit hall, 
the stone octagonal pavilion, or sometimes it's known as the sail barn, that was constructed between 1935 and 39. And then there are three sandstone buildings, a 1930s frame barn, and a 1950 frame horse stall. So most, most of these buildings were built for the Works Progress Administration, WAPA projects in the 30s, and they are very good examples of using local materials and local labor to create this site. Next slide, please. Um, so some other rodeo highlights that I wanted to mention. There was no rodeo royalty until 1936. The first Sheridan Y.O. Rodeo Queen was Gladys Acola. Um, and the prize for Rodeo Queen was $50, and half was paid in the first year, and the second half was paid the following year. And Judy Slack is going to touch more on our Rodeo Queens in her presentation. Next slide, please. So parades. There's always been a rodeo parade every annual rodeo week, and sometimes, too, in 1937, the rodeo board decided to have two parades, one on the first day of the rodeo and one on the last day. And this was to fill a morning law, and also they thought if they did it twice, nobody would miss it, which is kind of interesting. Um, so the schedule of the two parades was maintained until the last performance before the war in 1941. Next slide, please. Um, the June 23, 1942 newspaper headline read, Sheridan Y.O. Rodeo is called off. The article described two heating meetings at the Chamber of Commerce the night before, and the board and businesses were kind of divided about this idea. And a vote was taken of the 12 rodeo board of directors and other businessmen that were present. The vote was 13 to 11 against the show, and according to this local news article, the reason was patriotic. And as we can see from the quote, it kind of just referenced that the government kind of canceled all these big events. Next slide, please. So from the Rodeo Time in Sheridan, Wyoming book, it states that the rodeo took like a Rip Van Winkle status and hibernated during the war. And it temporarily emerged in 1944. So in 1944, the Sheridan Rodeo emerged as the Bot Sot Stampede, a local rodeo for working cowboys. Although the Sheridan Wyo Rodeo Board was still in charge, they had good reasons for the name change and a smaller event. Since the war was still in progress, a two-day show was about all they could handle. The name change became because rather than put together, um, they're putting together basically a smaller event and they thought that the show was inferior to what they had. They didn't want to put the Sheridan Wyo Rodeo name on it. Um, and it was advisable for the name change and to temporar temporarily protect their pre-war reputation. The Botsat Stampede was conceived by combining the name of the 1914-15 and 1916 Stampede with its theme, Botsats. But then, in 1951, the Sheridan Wyo Rodeo returned. Next slide, please. Um, so next, I would like to introduce Judy Slack, local historian, author, and board member of the Bighorn City Historical Society, She's also the previous director of the Wyoming Room and will present the history of the All-American Indian Days. And we will do um, questions and comments at the end. Gonna change out the batteries. <laughs> See if it works. <laughs> Always something.
we'll try it. Oh, good. <laughs> it was the batteries. <laughs> Thank you for coming, and thank you, Carrie, for inviting me to give this presentation. I've been involved with All American Indian Days um, probably since I was about six years old <laughs> and volunteered for giving out programs when All American Indian Days was here. And then I worked for Mrs. Enzi for several years, and I worked with her during those years in the 60s and 70s. And then working at the Wyoming Room, we ended up with about seven collections that we um, processed. So I've been working with All American Indian Days for several years. Um, I want to clarify that in this article, I did not write this article. It was written by Miss Indian America, Dina Haragara Waters, and she was Miss Indian America 22. Now see if it's gonna work. Um, as you can see, for many years, Sheridan and our civic leaders have had an ongoing relationship with our Indian neighbors. I'm going to give you a little side note. What I learned working in the Wyoming room is that the gentleman holding the large American flag is Chief Medicine Crow. He's usually nearby it or holding that flag. And we'll be talking about Joe Medicine Crow, his grandson, in a bit. So you've seen this slide before in Carrie's presentation. Um, I picked this slide because you can see there are several Indians in this photo. They have always paraded with us and danced. The Crow Nation have come down for many years. And they came down in the 1890s and did the reenactment of the Custer Battlefield. And then later, the Cheyenne came to help as well. The Northern Cheyenne Indians have been involved as well with um, the Indian relay races. However, during the 30s and 40s, discrimination was obvious in Sheridan, with signs in the store that said no dogs or Indians allowed. Then in 1951, Lucy Yellowmill was chosen as rodeo queen. And she was a young Crow girl and she um, came from a Crow Agency, and she's the, the gal in the middle. And let's see if I can get this to work. Okay. <laughs> During her younger years, she became an accomplished rider and jockey. There were, during the 40s, there were a lot of horse races here in uh, Sheridan and also in Billings. So she was hired to be a jockey. In 1951, she became the first American Indian to be selected as a Sheridan Wyo Rodeo Queen. The story goes, the rodeo cowboys knew she was an expert rider, and so they sat by the applause meter and cheered her on. That's how she won. Uh, the success of Lucy Yellowmule's reign as Rodeo Queen inspired the creation of the Miss Indian America pageant. And these two ladies, I just found this photo. Uh, the lady on the left is Margot Realbird. The lady on the left is, I mean on the right is Kathleen Michelina Smith. They were Lucy's runner-ups back in 1951. Um, Margot was the second runner-up, and uh, Kathleen was the first runner-up, the lady-in-waiting. And this is another great um, shot of Lucy. Um, she actually was the rodeo queen for one year, but she served Sheridan for two years to promote all American Indian Days and the Miss Indian America pageant. And um, she died in 1996. However, in the Wyoming room, we found a recording of her voice back in 1951 or two. I can't remember the year, that, but we have her voice recorded. She was a very shy girl. On the left is William Henry Harrison, and then Lucy is right next to him. The gentleman on the right is Neck Yoke Jones, and um, his real name was Howard Sinclair, but he was a reporter for the Sheridan Press, and his pen name was Neck Yoke Jones. He was a big promoter of All American Indian Days. In 1953, Lucy travels to Washington, D.C. 
She went there to receive the National Freedoms Foundation Award for Sheridan. It was a George Washington Medal of Recognition for efforts to build a better understanding between Indians of all tribes and the white communities. Um, this was about 11 years prior to the National Civil Rights Movement, so Sheridan was ahead of its time. Later in 1958, Sheridan once again won a national title, and it was All-American City. Joe Medicine Crow was involved with All-American Indian Days since its inception. Um, he served as the MC from 1953 through 1984. And Joe got involved because when he came back from the war, um, he was in uniform and nobody in Sheridan would serve him a hamburger. So he went to Hamburger Louis and, ha and Louis gave him a hamburger. And um, Louis was from Pakistan, so he knew about discrimination. And so Joe uh, met with Nekio Jones, along with Don Dearnose from the Crow Nation, and they decided to eradicate prejudice in Indian country by starting All-American Indian Days. So Joe and Don drove around to the western states and invited Indians to show up on Friday of Rodeo Week in 1953. It was called All-American Indian Day. And I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of Indians showed up, um, possibly as many as 4,000. And Don Dearnose um, also served on the All-American Indian Days board for probably the full 30 years. We have a quote from uh, Miss Indian America 22. Dina Haragera has written, he would tell how one or two men would come up from Sheridan and talk to him about what they could do to make different races understand each other or to make their part of the world better for all people. So the first year, Arlene Wesley was chosen as Miss Indian America. And they traveled here from Yakima, Washington. It took them a long time to come, but she remembers camping out the whole way. Her whole family came. Um, Arlene attended our reunion in 2013. It was the 60th anniversary of her crowning. And then in 2015, she returned to our art show. We later learned that the art show we did in 2015 was the first national art show to feature women from different tribes. We had six former Miss Indian American um, artists that day. And this is another wonderful photo of Arlene. We can't find the original. Um, this is what her family did. They were beaters. They beaded all the regalia on the horse and all of um, what her traditional dress is. So they did that in like less than two years. All American Indian Day's parades got bigger and bigger. We don't know if this is a during rodeo or if this was during All American Indian Days. It gets to be such a big event, they split off from the rodeo and had their own multi-day celebration, and that was in August of every year. So there were competitions at the fairgrounds, of, and it involved all of the families. Um, there was fry bread competition, dancing competitions, arts and crafts, the blanket race, and teepee building races. One year, um, we believe this is 1957, there were over 100 Miss Indian America contestants. There were over 100 tribes represented, and this was a time when Sheridan was only a town of about 11,000. We had an influx of four to 5,000 Indians who came. So the church ceremonies, um, all of Sheridan County churches came to the fairgrounds that Sunday of American, All American Indian Days, and that's where the church services were held. And the Indians would camp out at the fairgrounds. They also camped out east of town, um, north at uh, the Rice Ranch, and we know they camped all the way out to Dayton. So this church service became very, very popular, and one of the things that was major was the um, singing of the Lord's Prayer and the um, sign language. So some of the Miss Indian American contestants would be 
out there performing the sign language. So the Miss Indian Americas, they served <clears throat> Sheridan in the state of Wyoming as ambassadors. This is the governor and Clifford Hansen talking with Sharon Auton Harjo. She was Miss Indian America 12, and these are the other contestants in 1966. They traveled all over the United States. Here we have Michelle Portwood. She was Miss Indian America 11. She was <clears throat> the chaperone to Wahela, and Wahela was Miss Indian America 13. And here is William Henry Harrison again in the center. So the ambassadorship went on for about a year. These girls, when they were chosen, they gave up a whole year of their life, and they stayed in Sheridan in host families' homes. And um, some of them had a difficult time assimilating into the white world. So we had Susie Yellowtail come down from the Crow Nation to help them. And so it was a, a constant um, event that these girls had to go to year round. And so sometimes Susie would go as a chaperone. Sometimes the host families would be the chaperones. Um, this is Wahela, and she's in Washington, D.C. with Stuart Udall and Lady Bird Johnson. Some of these girls went um, around the world. I mean, it was a huge effort for Sheridan to put this on year round. Can you imagine? It's a lot of work, a lot of money, and a lot of time. So eventually, the cost became too high for the town, and the civic leaders were struggling to keep folks committed to the year-long events. It eventually closed in Sheridan in 1984 and reopened in North Dakota only to end in 1990. This is our reunion we held in 2013. We had 13 former Miss Indian Americas in attendance. We also had um, a reunion in 2015. This was the art show. And these are uh, the participants in the powwow that year. Uh, we also had Miss Indian Americas. Um, Arlene came, Miss Indian America won. Um, Arlene passed away in 2017. Willie was Miss Indian America 10, and she passed away in 2019. Brenda Bearchum, her daughter is uh, sitting here. She was Miss Indian America 8. She had just passed away before this picture was taken. And then we have uh, Dina, Miss Indian America 22, um, sitting next to Butch Jealous. I uh, also know that we've lost one more Miss Indian America to COVID. She passed about a year ago. So the connection between Sheridan Rodeo um, is Miss Indian America, I'm sorry, the Rodeo Queen, uh, Lucy Yellow Yule, and um, she um, began all American Indian Days and the Miss Indian America pageant. It came here and it was here for 30 years and it's all because of her winning Rodeo Queen. So. Thank you very much for coming. Okay, so we will now show the documentary. Um, for those of joining us on the YouTube live stream, if you could please click on the video link that is provided in the YouTube description to watch the documentary, that would be great. And thank you for joining us today. Um, so the documentary is called No Indians or Dogs Allowed, Sheridan, Wyoming and Miss Indian America Pageant. This documentary was created in 2013 when Miss Indian America title holders returned to Sheridan, Wyoming, which Judy mentioned to us in her presentation. Um, the creator, Gregory Nickerson, is originally from Sheridan County. He is a writer, historian, and filmmaker. And we thank Greg for sharing this documentary with us today. <laughs> 